Hi, Kathleen Guire here. Welcome to Trauma Informed Parenting. There is a big difference between disobedience and a reaction based on either past trauma and or a capital letter syndrome where your child is viewing life through a different lens. So what happens is we see this dysregulation and we call it disobedience. Sometimes we call it rebellion or obstinance. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. So we have to figure out what the difference is. And when you are raising kiddos with a trauma history or a capital letter syndrome, you have to expect to co-regulate a lot more than your peers with neurotypical children do. Expect to co-regulate a lot more than your peers with children who don't have a trauma history. And so when you see this obstinance or you see these over the top reactions, then you have to step back and say, what is the need behind that behavior? Is it because they were triggered by a sight, a sound, a smell? They didn't know what the expectation was. They didn't know what was going to happen next. So we have to step back and think about those things. And don't base your expectation on whether you need to help them regulate on their physical age or size or both. Many children who do not have early experiences of proper care also lack proper physiological and emotional regulation. This is because both of these regulation systems are developed in and through an attachment relationship. That's from nurturing adoptions. So we have to step back and connect more. We have to connect more. We have to attach more. We have to make sure that our kiddos feel safe. So that's number two. I didn't say number one for number one, but number two is make sure your children feel safe. It's not really about being safe. It's about feeling safe. If your kiddos feel safer, with a light on, we're not going to the noisy party, or staying near you at a family function, then just let them, don't complain. 10 years from now, is it gonna matter? That's what I always say. I always do the 10 year lens test, like 10 years from now, is it gonna matter that she stayed beside you at the party at your aunt's house because she didn't feel safe? Not saying that she wasn't safe, just she didn't feel safe. All right, number three, keep the positive connecting experiences coming. The brain is experience expectant. We come hardwire for connection, for eye contact. Now, I know some kids who are neurodivergent do not like eye contact, but some kiddos do. We need touch, we need playful interactions and co-regulation. These kids need the emotional tank filled up before their brains are going to engage. So the more that we fill their emotional tanks up with connection, the more we're going to rewire their brains. And I'm thinking of an example I was talking um, to my daughter about where you're doing the um, play, you know, and there's a purpose to the play. There's always a purpose to play. But if you're on the floor and you're playing with a little boy and he's a or a little girl and they have their car and they're making it go upside down instead of on the wheels, just spinning the wheels maybe. That was her example. Instead of correcting them and saying, oh, put the car this way, just put yourself in their world and say something like, oh, I like how those wheels are turning. Do you like how those wheels are turning? So you're making a connection on their level. And that's what they need. And when you make that connection, then you're able to enter their world a little bit more and have a little bit more say without their responding with obstinance or being triggered. They feel safer. Another thing you can do, just figure out what your kid needs, but I'm just going to list a few. Blow bubbles, ride bikes together, make cookies and eat them. My kids were always like, oh, you're making cookies? Or who are those for? <laughs> Read a favorite book 50 times. 
swim with them. Don't just watch them swim. Don't be the couch potato parent. I know it's really popular now. I see it at the park when I go to the park, like parents are on their phones and the kids are playing. I'm not saying you have to swing on the monkey bars with them, but engage to, oh my gosh, you're doing a great job. Look at you swinging. Oh, you went up the slide. You did, you came down the slide. Hike with them. Take time to invest in the positive experiences. This is investment parenting. Just a note, this practice applies to teens as well. If you are filling in the gaps of missed co-regulation, an older teen may still want you to watch them jump on the trampoline, ride bikes with them, play board games, or watch movies. Many teens with a trauma history may have no interest in doing what their peers are doing and may want to ha hang out with mom and dad because they may be half their physical age. So if you have a 16 year old and all of his friends are like, no, we don't need mom and dad. We want to go out and do things together. And your 16 year old is saying, I just want to play a board game or I want to watch a movie with you. I just want to hang out with mom and dad. Let them. Now, number four, filling in the gaps of co missed co-regulation. With these kiddos, no matter what their age and size, we must co-regulate when they can't. And I've mentioned this in another video, but I will repeat these kind of things over and over again because they're so important. A 12 year old who cannot recognize his body signals to eat or drink must be provided with a snack and water every two hours or he will enter the fight, flight, fawn or freeze mode. And why is this important to what I said earlier, like this, the disobedience or the over the top reactions, your child, if they're not getting proper nutrition because they don't recognize their body's own signals to eat and drink and their cortisol levels are so high that they feel, they don't feel hungry. They don't feel like eating. And then you notice this pattern of meltdown, 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 all day long. And you're wondering why. It may, it may be as simple as the child needs something to drink. They're dehydrated, they're mildly dehydrated. A lot of kids with trauma histories walk around mildly dehydrated all the time, or they need a snack. They need someone to make sure that they have a snack, that they eat food. And those things are so important. And um, I did a whole podcast on why my child isn't listening and three steps in getting them to listen. I think that was the title. But one of the, the, the things is just making sure they eat and drink. Maybe they're not listening. Maybe they're being obstinate because their body is slightly dehydrated and their cortisol levels are so high they can't manage eating because they don't know they're hungry. So I'm going to finish up today, but there's, you have to just watch for these cues. You just have to remember that it's not always, it's not always something that is super difficult to figure out. And disobedience is not always just being rebellious or obstinate. Often it can be a reaction based on past trauma, or it can be because the child has a capital letter syndrome, they can't read social cues, they don't know what's going on, they don't know what to expect, they're hungry, they're tired, they're thirsty. So don't make it more difficult than it is. I hope this is helpful. Thanks for joining me today.